good good morning good morning ladies and gentlemen um it's a uh, five past nine we're ready to start with our show for today my name is kula nichawuke i'm the the media manager here at the csir and i'll be facilitating the session today so the session we're having today is about the cyber security surveys that uh, the csir has conducted and um, <clears throat> our colleagues will be sharing the, the presentations and from surveys that have done from different sectors. Uh, but before we get into that, I would like to welcome everyone in att att attendance, uh, the media colleagues present here, uh, the CSR colleagues as well, and also the people who are attending online. I would like to welcome you to the to this briefing. Um, as I've mentioned, that uh, we'll have a different presentations today. First of all, we'll start with Dr. Dr. Jamunswain, who is the head of uh, Cyber Security Center in the CSIR, who will give us an overview of the of the surveys, and then we'll get the remarks from a uh, from the for, for, we'll get the we'll get the remarks from Dr. Kiru Pillay uh, from the Cyber Security Hub at the Department of Communication and Digital uh, Technologies. Uh, these presentations will be followed by. Uh, uh, the surveys that the center has done. So we'll have four presenters today who will give us the surveys. These presenters will be uh, Dr. Namusha, uh, Mrs. Homba, uh, Ms. Tuli, and Mr. Samuel. Uh, so after these presentations, we are going to have a Q&A where members of the media and other, others in attendance will be able to ask questions and then the colleagues will be able to respond. And then the colleagues who are attending online you can share your questions through the chat, or you can uh, you can raise your hand on the chat on 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 on, on the on, t on, on the Teams link or on YouTube, and then the colleagues, my colleagues, Lindy and uh, and Petul will facilitate that section of the Q and A, and then uh, for the media colleagues who will need uh, interviews after the session, uh, our colleagues are available to engage with you and elaborate further on the presentations that they will be sharing today. So without any further waste of time. I will uh, welcome Dr. Javum to the studio to give us an overview of the uh, the surveys. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Let me just uh, share. I, I hope everyone can see me. And uh, uh, good morning, and thank you for taking time uh, to just come in uh, and listen to us uh, to present some of the work uh, that we do here at the CSR and uh, uh, sort of share some insights on the surveys and uh, that um, uh, we have uh, we have done so i'm not going to be to be long except to say the work that we are doing here today uh, is obviously the work of uh, uh, national importance because us as the csr we support uh, the development of a capable state and uh, when we uh, conceptualize the cyber security surveys it was about how do we uh, create um, insights that are local and contextual because in the cyber security space most of the data that we use uh, tends to uh, come you know from global companies uh, but this is the is, is the start of, of the work so when we just look at the picture that i'm showing here on the screen we can clearly see that uh, cyber security is a pandemic if i can call it that so it's almost similar uh, to corruption, if you kind of look at it, when we look at, at, at money issues. So over the past 10 years, uh, cybersecurity has been you know, increasing. Uh, and this clearly suggests that criminals are finding easier ways uh, you know, to make money. They are no longer physically robbing uh, the banks. Of course, we know um, th that uh, in the digital space, there's more of us now. We, we generate more data. There's more mobile devices and the likes. And that's, that's what we see. And this is some of the work uh, that we have been doing uh, since since last year as well. Just to give you uh, an indication, this problem that we are talking about today is not just a South African problem, uh, but it is a problem that uh, impacts uh, the world over. And I think we have not yet as a people, as a country uh, and as nation realized the impact of this. And I will share uh, some quick data points now just to, uh, to, to, to give uh, the, the, the indication. If we look you know, for example, um, in terms of this uh, survey, what was key for us was that 
we need to at, at least generate contextual and local data uh, so that uh, there could be more informed decision making, but also uh, that our leaders uh, can make, uh, you know, when they develop policies, uh, there is uh, data that they can rely on that is contextual, that is South Africa based. So that's very, very important for us. But when we look at just some other studies that have been done, and I know our colleagues will speak more about what we have done, we realize that the information regulator tells us that at least every month, uh, there's about 150 data breaches that are reported by companies. Now, that's just those who are reporting. It's almost 150. In the previous year, there was about 50. So if you just look at the increase, it's very, very high. And those data breaches, they, they come with other impacts on individuals. It could be, you know, identity fraud. Uh, it could be people cloning our SIM, our, our, our SIM cards and uh, uh, conducting transactions, illegal transactions on our behalf. So that's what is happening. And that's why the CSR, in collaboration with the Cybersecurity Hub, which is under the Department of Communications and Digital Technologies, we then decided uh, to do uh, this, uh, this particular work. And um, we looked at the whole country. And um, uh, obviously there were telephone interviews as well as online questionnaires where it was possible. In total, there's about 1,200 respondents. And I know uh, it might not necessarily be representative of the country, but when I look at the US elections, for example, and they do you know, polls, the numbers uh, generally are around there. Uh, but the surveys were diverse as well. We just did not focus on the ICT sector. We looked at the financial sector you know, and various other sectors that the colleagues uh, will speak about. Uh, and we also looked at about four areas, which the colleagues will, will, will talk about. And I will explain why we also touched on these four areas. So if you look, I think one of the critical aspects when you look into the impact of cybersecurity attacks, one key issue is that companies are unable to, to respond, you know, on time or even when they respond, there's sometimes skills shortage. So, so the colleagues will share a little bit more what they found, especially with the uh, introduction of the hybrid and remote work, they will share a little bit more there, as well as uh, the incidents, because generally, um, normally uh, the data that we have relies, let's say on company A or company B, telling us that there are so much uh, incidences. But in this case, these are the real users and real companies who are telling us how much of cyber incidents they are experiencing on a regular on a regular basis we also look at the preparedness as well as resilience in terms of um, how prepared and resilient are we as a country when it comes to cyber security incidents and then looking into the future as well uh, because we know that many many of these cyber security incidences they are um, spurred by uh, you know digital data so we say digital identity as a new concept, where are we in, in that regard? And the colleagues will talk briefly about that. And then just to summarize, uh, because the colleagues will share a lot of this, uh, they are the experts, they will talk more about it. But what we are seeing is that organizations and individuals are not immune. You know, I always make this example that whether you are poor, whether you are rich, whether you're from the location, whether you're from suburb, whether you are from wherever, right? It doesn't matter. You are not immune to, to, to these attacks as well um, as that as a, a nation, we are ill-prepared and in, in, in terms of dealing with it. And the colleagues will share more data on that. Um, and then the other thing we see uh, is that uh, organizations, I assume, I assume we have been hacked. So it happens all the time. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I think it's it okay, right? Thank you. So one other thing we see is that cyber security awareness is obviously not prioritized, uh, you know, with uh, about uh, uh, two thirds of the organizations, only 30 percent train their people, as well as we find that cyber security skills is a, is, a, is, a, is a big gap. And then also that four in 10 organizations, they see cyber security as part of their daily operation. So many think that cyber security is something that you can do once and forget about it. And then the last part is more identity theft. As I said, when we think about cybersecurity today and, and, and we make a fuss about it, it is because it is now at the same scale level as corruption as well as um, and, and other uh, challenges in the country when it comes to financial impact, social impact and the likes. And I want to thank you uh, for being here.
uh, for being online and for having interest in this. Uh, the colleagues will share their data and then at a later stage, the reports will also be available uh, on our website for you to go into details uh, with regards to them. So Kulani, uh, let me give back to you. I don't know if uh, Dr. Kiro is online um, and then if he's not online, we can maybe proceed uh, with regards to the colleagues. He can come in later. I'm not sure, is he online? Okay, no, I, I think if he's not online, you can come and then we will proceed. Thank you very much. Uh, no, thank you, Doc. Uh, I don't see Dr. Kiru online, but uh, when they join, we'll uh, ac accommodate them later in the program. So without wasting any time, I'd like to welcome Namusha on stage to share with us a presentation. Good morning. I'm Namosha Virasamy, and I'm a principal researcher here within the Information and Cybersecurity Center in the CSR. Today, I'll be sharing insights about the survey relating to the cybersecurity skills gap in South Africa. So, a statistic from statistics.com shows that nearly 60% of organizations globally say they are understaffed with regards to their cybersecurity workforce. And we only have 3% indicating that they have a surplus of cybersecurity professionals. So what we find is that globally, there's a shortage of cybersecurity skills. And from the survey, we were also able to deduct that South Africa too is also facing challenges with regards to the cybersecurity workforce. So an overview of the presentation today, I will be looking at five main categories of the findings. I'll be looking at the demand for skills, critical skills, gap certifications and investments, challenges, and then representation. So just an overview of the present of the, of the survey, there was 321 respondents with 35 questions. And what we found largely is that most of the respondents come from the larger provinces, which is Gauteng, KZN, and the Western Cape. The majority of the organizations had a thousand members and the surveys um, took place across various sectors like the IT, financial, educational, agricultural and healthcare sectors. So let's jump into the findings. So we asked members about what was their most valued skills. So the responses given was that incident, incident response came out at 68%, cloud security at 64%, and risk governance and compliance at 64%. So this is quite um, important because incident response is critical if a, a cyber attack occurs, so that organizations are able to respond and get their systems back online. We also find that most organizations are using cloud security, so it's imperative that they keep the data safe and prevent data breaches. Overall, organizations need risk governance and compliance to ensure that their systems are protected at the forefront. So when asked the question about required skills going forward into the future, 60% indicated AI. We see now that there's a huge drive for AI skills because it's going to be used across the board and also um, to ensure that there are new methods devised to detect cyber attacks. Going forward, 57% also indicated they would need threat intelligence. And if we look at the protection of data, data breaches and privacy enforcement came out at 50% for required skills in the future. Overall, 76% indicated that there is a greater shortage of cybersecurity skills compared to IT skills. So this is quite a critical finding that whereby we see that there is a bigger demand for cybersecurity skills. For skills that organizations are currently facing a shortage for, we found that 45% indicated that they needed better cybersecurity education skills, 39% for threat intelligence, and risk and governance for 36%. So here again, the statistic shows that organizations are wanting to upskill and improve their cybersecurity posture, but are facing challenges with regard to the educational aspects. No problem. The next statistic was regards to hiring demand. 
So in with regards to the hiring demand in upcoming years, we found for the cybersecurity prof practitioner, 86% indicated there would be an increase in demand. For cybersecurity management, 74% indicated there would be increasing demand. And then 62% indicated there would be a greater demand for senior management or executive. So you can see all of the different types of roles, it is estimated that there will be increased needs going forward in the future. So with regards to um, the qualifications of candidates, 38% indicated that less than 25% had the required qualifications. 35% indicated that of the applicants, they only had 25 to 50% of the required qualifications. And 19% indicated that they had 50 to 75% of the required qualifications. And merely 4% stated that the applicants had 75 to 100% of the required qualifications. So what we find here is that in the majority of cases, when applicants do apply for positions, in many of the cases, they have substantially um, less requirements in terms of qualifications. Then when we look at the challenges with regards to recruitment and retention, we find that the hurdles for filling vacancies, some of the reasons cited was scarce skills, so this is 64%. So again, here we see that scarce skills is quite a big um, challenge. Also competitive salaries, so there's financial constraints. And we find that 55% of the, of the respondents indicated that HR is experiencing challenges in finding qualified candidates. So the reasons for resignations given was, again, financial issues like salaries, benefits, or the working conditions. And then with regards to the time to fill positions, 21% indicated it took a staggering six months to fill a position. 22% indicated it took three months, and then we had just 10% um, that said it took just two weeks to fill a position. So with regards to um, the skills gap certifications and investment, we had a response that 88% invest in cybersecurity resources, but 50% still agree it is not sufficient. So then when we look at certifications, the most sought after certifications by cybersecurity professionals, these were the CIS certification, which is a professional certification, and this was 52% of the respondents. Then we have the auditing one, this was 36% indicated they sought the certification, as well as CISM, which is a management one. And then the privacy certification, 35% indicated they sought the certification. So with regards to uh, remote work and gender representation, we found that 77% um, agreed that there was a need for stronger cybersecurity skills because many people are now working remotely. We also found some challenges in the sector with regards to the perceptions of males and females. And what we find is that 82% believe that cybersecurity is dominated by males. We also find that 61% of females are experiencing challenges with regards to gender bias, lack of awareness, or discrimination. So overall, the findings of the survey indicate that, yes, there are challenges in South Africa as well. And this is stemming largely from skills. We have a shortage of skills. So I would now like to just briefly talk about another concept, the concept of a learning factory. And this is an idea that we have propagated within the CSR. So the concept comes from the manufacturing sector whereby workers were trained. Here at the CSR, we've tried to start building up a learning factory in order to provide skills development and skills upliftment. So in the learning factory environment, members are able to participate in various exercises, practices, and exposure to cybersecurity in order to help with this challenge. We have a global challenge, and in the South African context, we're trying to provide some form of, of skills development. So typically, how would a cybersecurity learning factory work? So as we ICT and IT can also offer services online, there's the potential to also offer these practicals or exercises from a virtual environment, as well as set up physical training sessions. Um, it can also incorporate concepts like gamification and thinking like the adversary, thinking like an attacker, in order for members to actually get hands-on experience. All of this, we, will incorporate, we have incorporated simulations, emulations, training exercises, practical ways for members to gain more experience. So the reasoning behind the learning factory as well, if we look at the traditional forms of learning, what we find is that 
The traditional methods like lecturing, reading, and demonstration have retention rates between 5 and 30%. But something like practice by doing has a retention rate of 75%. So it will be quite vital to enable members to actually practice by doing and thus learn and gain the skills in a much viable format. So overall, the aim with the Learning Factory as well is try and develop all of these competencies that are shortage of. To, and with this Learning Factory, it's not just about training new members. Um, On-the-job training is also important, so therefore it can also assist with reskilling. Re so we are trying to contribute to building up this upcoming workforce and also enhance skill sets in order to also potentially in the future have a direct uptake. Overall, these cybersecurity professionals that can be developed will not just work in the IT environment, they would also work across the board. As I mentioned before, cybersecurity is important not just to the ICT domain, Finance, security, healthcare, tourism, all of these sectors also need good cybersecurity. So it's important that we have a digital transformation across the board. So to wrap up, uh, we found that the cybersecurity skills gap is widening and it's imperative to look at new innovative approaches in order to help with upskilling, retraining, um, providing experiential learning and getting targeted training out there so that members can get more exposure and understanding of cybersecurity skills. So that wrap brings to a close my presentation on the findings on the cybersecurity skills gap survey. I'll now hand over to my colleague, um, Homban Jigani, to take you through the next survey. Good morning, colleagues. My name is Wamba Gazilekane. I am a cyber security researcher leading a data security and analytics team uh, or research group in the CSIR. And I am focusing on the cyber attack incident in South Africa, uh, covering both the public and um, private sectors. And um, these are the uh, points that I will be making or that I will be making, uh, the problem statement, the aim of the survey, the key findings, observations, and then recommendations. I, uh, let me just put here. So on the problem or the key challenges that the country is facing or that the organizations within uh, South Africa We've already notified that there's a global increase in cybersecurity trends uh, or cyber attacks. And apart from that, there are then other challenges that we are facing as a country. For example, um, the, the lack of uh, cybersecurity skills and also the, um, oh, sorry. Oh, okay, and another point is that um, the, there's another survey by Cisco where, for example, um, uh, okay, so these slides are ch been changed. I'm unable to, okay, sorry. L let me just cut afresh that with the three points that we have picked as, uh, as highlights, there is a survey by IBM where, for example, they are indicating that there's been an increase of cyber breaches and also cyber attacks in the country, and it costs the country or the organizations about 53 million per, per incident. And that has, been, that has been an increase from 42 um, million that was reported last year, that is in 2023. And then, according to Cisco, there is lack of um, uh, cyber security skills, which means that the organizations are not prepared when it comes to um, the cyber attacks. Then there's also general lack of data in the country. Therefore, the aim of the survey was then to contextualize the cyber attacks experienced by South African organizations, uh, covering um, the frequency, the types of attacks, the root causes, 
the impact uh, time, it, the time it takes to recover from an attack, and then the mitigation, remediation, and preventi preventative strategies. Uh, thank you. Uh, also, another objective then to assist um, drawing the picture of what's currently happening so that then um, security professionals can then be able to draw well-informed decisions um, when responding to cyber attacks. So on the key findings, we had asked the, the respondents on the frequency of attacks. Okay, so on the frequency of attacks, for example, we have asked the respondents if they have experienced a cyber attack and how many times have they, um, have they been attacked. And from their response, we have discovered that 88% have indicated that they have been breached, with 90% having been uh, attacked more than once. And then uh, a 12% saying they haven't been attacked. Then on the types of cyber, of cyber incidents experienced, um, uh, the organizations have indicated uh, a digital, uh, I mean, a, a denial of service, a ransomware attack, uh, wiper attacks, and then on the top three, we found that malware are leading with application attacks and cyber incidents. Then on the root causes, um, on the top three, again, we highlighted that uh, the root causes are mainly third party connected to an enterprise, um, end user phishing, and hardware based. Attack. I mean, yes, hardware-based hardware -based attacks. And then on the damage in terms of infrastructure, we measured that in terms of disruption, uh, where, for example, low was in number of hours and then uh, moderate being number of days and high being, num I mean, weeks, and then very high uh, being a, a disruption of a, of a month. And 4% um, then on, of the study, or for example, about 78% uh, of them from low to moderate have indicated that they had um, a low to moderate e uh, uh, disruption, and then 19% uh, uh, being high, and then 4% being very high. Then on the financial loss, uh, we were asked from the impact that they have experienced in terms of data, I mean, in terms of financial loss, what, were, what was the cost in care, uh, including, for example, fines or having the organization uh, hiring a, a service provider or, or uh, uh, paying for, for paying someone who is going to um, remediate the, the incident. And then we have found that 4% um, of the respondents have said they have lost up to a uh, 1 million. And then the other organizations were ranging from 50,000 to, let's say, for example, 500,000. And then on data loss or data leakages, we looked into personal identifiable information. And then it's more of a 50-50 because those who have um, responded with 58%, they have said even though they've incurred an incident, but then there was no data loss or a breach in terms of personal identifiable information. And then 40% saying, uh, yes, they have lost information. Then on the mitigation strategies, uh, post the incident, we looked into the security practices that were implemented, the, the remediations, and also the the preventative measures. Then on security practices, uh, the top three, they've mentioned that they've applied um, multi-factor authentication, uh, moving to exchange, and also using application security, continuous integration, and continuous development pipelines. And then on remediations, uh, the percentage there was uh, that of um, 
adopting to tools for web application and API protection, identity access management, and web security gateways. Then lastly, on the preventative measures, um, the top three again, the attack surface management was um, one of the key areas that the organizations have looked into. Then the third uh, party pen testing, or pen testing internally for vulnerability assessments, and then um, the bridge attack simulation or tabletop uh, exercises to gauge how prepared the organization is. Then um, following that are the key observations from the survey. For an, for an example, uh, the top three prevalent attacks, we have found out that it's malware, uh, application attacks and insider threats. Of course, um, malware would be the leading one because it forms a common or it's a family of um, malicious, um, uh, I would say maybe um, stuff, say for example, uh, URLs, your malicious files and um, any other downloads that is malicious and then followed by then application attacks and then insider threats. Then on the frequency, um, we have uh, realized that or we have observed that once an organization has been attacked once, then there's likelihood that it's going to be attacked, attacked uh, even uh, again and again uh, repeatedly. And then on the root causes, uh, we have observed that third party connections are the main root causes followed, followed by phishing and hardware based um, attacks where for example in third party connections then one I mean in third party connected to an enterprise then one can then conclude to say that for example if an if an entity is hosting data for let's say an organization or a bank then if that uh, entity gets attacked, then the organization itself will be affected. And then on the recovery, uh, we have discovered or we have observed that the higher the impact, then the, the, the longer it took for the organizations to, to recover from. And also with the exception of denial of service attacks, where, for example, they have mentioned that it almost uh, generally for them takes longer to, to recover from that type of an attack. Then on the recommendations based on the findings, uh, we have uh, identified the, the four <coughs> pillars, for example, uh, governance and risk management, and then employees, cybersecurity awareness, and also a multi-factor authentication, including disabling USB ports for external storage uh, to avoid insider threat fatalities. So basically, that's the then the the conclusion on my uh, in, on my presentation or on the survey uh, regarding cyber attacks related to or that are faced by. Um, South, uh, organizations in South Africa. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that presentation, Homba and Dr. Namusha. And to the media colleagues, we have the questions. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can just jot down your questions for now, and then we'll have a Q&A session after all the presentation. So now I'll welcome uh, uh, Ms. Tully to the stage to share with us a presentation. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues, and good morning to everyone who is listening from online. I'm Tulim Kwanazi, and today I'll be sharing the findings on a survey that was prepared. And the survey, the survey covered cybersecurity preparedness 
in the public sector. In the same breath of cybersecurity being a paramount challenge globally, we have found that it is especially so for the public sector. And by public sector, I mean all government institutions um, that handle citizens' data. So this report delves into the cybersecurity findings from those public sector entities within South Africa. The purpose of the study was to understand cybersecurity preparedness, how ready are the public institutions in terms of facing a cybersecurity attack or what plans are in place in responding to a cyber attack. So there were 301 respondents who completed the cybersecurity questionnaire. And it was a national survey that was conducted through telephone interviews and through online questionnaires. It was conducted in collaboration with the Department of Communication and Digital Technologies. So we had a total of 32 questions and we categorized them into three sections or three reports. So the first category was cybersecurity awareness and preparedness. The second one was cybersecurity policies and best practices. And the third was cybersecurity compliance and improvement. So it was a long survey questionnaire and it gave us a clearer perspective of how our public sector is handling cybersecurity and how prepared they are. So now I'm going to delve into the, the report findings covering cybersecurity awareness and preparedness. So these are some of the key findings. Public sector institutions in South Africa do conduct cybersecurity risk assessments and it is about 60% of them who does this. And this was a, a good representation. Um, despite the 64% who say they are very well prepared to handle a cyber attack, there's still a small percentage of about 6% who lack the confidence in handling any cybersecurity incidents. However, there's a positive trend in employee cybersecurity awareness and training. There's still room for improvement, though, with 7% of organizations saying they are not training their staff in terms of cybersecurity awareness. And then 47% have experienced one to five cybersecurity incidents in the past year. So that is about half of the respondents. And this highlights uh, the prevalence of cyber threats. 89% of the institutions do have a formal cybersecurity incident response plan in place, which is good um, positioning them in a position to be able to handle any cyber attacks and to have a plan in place. So malware and phishing attacks are the most common cyber threats. Um, my previous colleague alluded to that as well. So these are the most challenging cybersecurity threats that public sector is facing. Encouragingly, a 64% um, of the organizations review their response plan at least quarterly, indicating a proactive approach and more chances of improving their cybersecurity preparedness. So now I'll be presenting some interesting graphs and statistics that were um, extracted from the reports. So in terms of the frequency of cybersecurity risks that were assessed among the public sector, it was found that 41% do assess their cybersecurity risks daily. And 1% said they do not know if they do review their cybersecurity, the chances of them being attacked. And 27% said they do review their cybersecurity risks at least weekly and 25% review that at a monthly basis. So in terms of the statistics, uh, we are on the screen, we are looking at a proportion of organizations that face cybersecurity threats. So what is interesting here is that the green group represents um, uh, the number of employees. So the first group is 5,000 and more employees. The last group is organizations with one to 100 employees. 
what we found is that organizations with a larger number of employees face a greater risk of cyber um, cyber security risk and threats. We see that um, the the first group, which is five thousand or more employees. Organizations with 5,000 or more employees say that they face about 11 and more cybersecurity risks. And the group with the least number of employees of 1 to 100 uh, reported the least number of cybersecurity threats. In this graph, we are looking at the cyber attacks that public institutions are facing. And the first two are the highest, which is malware attacks and phishing attacks. So these are a problem within our public sector. And then in this slide, we are looking at uh, the x-axis represents the number of cybersecurity risks. And we see that 95.2% of organizations agree that they are a, at a risk of being attacked by cyber criminals. And only 4.8% said they do not foresee a risk of being attacked. So what is important is it's not the number of the risks that they are facing. However, they, every organization will be attacked at some point and they should be prepared and ready to face such an incident. So in this graph, we, are, we asked a question, how many cybersecurity incidents have occurred in the past year? So 16% said they, have, they haven't faced any cybersecurity incidents. A 47%, which is almost half of the respondents, agreed that they have faced one or five cybersecurity incidents in the past year. Only 5% said they are not aware if they have been attacked or not. So interestingly, 89% of the organizations said that they do have a formal cybersecurity incident response plan in place. Should there be a cybersecurity event, they do have a plan in place. They, each employee would know how to respond. However, the 11% is, is still concerning as we know that cybersecurity attacks have an impact. So it's not necessarily about the number that is prepared, but it's about the interconnectedness. And should one organization be attacked, how, how far would the impact be spread? So in this statistic, we are looking at um, two factors, which is cybersecurity preparedness and readiness. And we are looking at the number of organizations that have their employees trained. So on the x-axis is the number of, or rather the percentage of organizations who say they train their staff on cybersecurity awareness. And on the y-axis, we have the preparedness. So the darker amber are the respondents that say they have a low confidence in terms of how prepared they are, should there be a cybersecurity event. And then the higher amber say they have a high preparedness. So in terms of the statistic that we're looking at, organizations that train their, cyber, their staff on cybersecurity awareness reported that they have a high confidence in terms of the preparedness uh, should there be a cyber attack. So we correlated this that um, the more that the staff is trained in cybersecurity awareness, the more the, the whole organization is um, at a better position to handle a cyber attack. And then in this slide, we asked a, a question, how many employees in the organizations have, re um, have received cybersecurity awareness training in the past year? 7% said they have not trained their staff, which is also alarming. And more than 75% say that they, they only 14% of the employees are trained. So this indicated that um, in the public sector, the main risk that they face is not training their cybersecurity, their employees in cybersecurity awareness. And we saw the, correl the, the correlation in the previous slide that the more that the employees are trained, the better they can face a cyber attack.
And this is also still on cybersecurity awareness and training. And we have placed much emphasis on this because uh, people still play a larger role in terms of um, cybersecurity. So what we're looking at here is the percentage of staff that train um, their employees. And this is in correlation with cybersecurity skills. So on the x-axis, we see that 74% uh, percent of the organizations say that they do train their staff, and then 60% percent say they do not. And we see that the, on the y-axis, it's the data breaches. So it still um, correlates with the previous slides that the more that the organization train their staff, the lesser data breaches that they face. So this is what this statistic is presenting. And the um, organization that said only 60%, the 60% the 60 of organizations that do not train their staff on cybersecurity reported a number, reported a higher number um, of data breaches. And then on this one, we were looking at how the organizations detect and respond to phishing attacks, which was one of the leading attacks that was reported as being a challenge. So 71% said that they use um, user awareness training, 67% um, multi-factor authentication, and 59% email filtering. So this uh, presentation shows that the public sector is aware that this, um, the, the organization should train staff on cybersecurity awareness. And this is how you would be better prepared to face any cybersecurity um, attack. Because as much as you may have the technology, but if the staff is not trained on how to use the technology or what to be aware of online uh, or in protecting that data, then the more they are not prepared for any cyber attacks. And then on this graph, we asked, does the organization follow any cybersecurity framework or standard? And here we wanted to see how do they govern cybersecurity. So 71% agreed that they follow the NIST cybersecurity framework. 50% agreed that they use the ISO 27001 and 2. And 31% said they are following COVID. So 2% said, yes, they do follow some cybersecurity standards, uh, but it's not the top three that we see here. And only 5% of the institution said, no, they do not follow any cybersecurity framework or standard. And then to sum up the three categories that I mentioned uh, without going through each and every question, these are the key findings specifically on cybersecurity policies and best practices. 95% of the organizations do have an information security policy and they use this to manage um, access. And then 50% perform automatic patches and updates on their applications, on their um, operating systems, and only 1% uh, do so only after an incident. 95% uh, have a backup and recovery plan in place, which is uh, a good presentation and a, a good indicator of preparedness. Uh, should there be a cyber attack, they will be able to recover their data. And 1% said that they do not run any security assessments. This shows that they are not aware of the threats that they are facing in their environment. And um, encryption is one of the ways that organizations use to protect their sensitive data and information. 80% use access control to detect and respond to insider threats. And this um, access controls are used in conjunction with user monitoring and data loss uh, protection. So here we got an indication of what cybersecurity controls are in place within the public sector. To conclude, uh, we have found that larger organizations report more incidents 
Um, however, the size of the organization does not correlate with how frequent they conduct their risk assessment. Cybersecurity training leads to a better preparedness and fewer data breaches. Most organizations use multiple protective controls such as malware encryption and access controls, and this ensures an in-depth protection of their data. And most of the organizations do follow a cybersecurity framework. Uh, the top two were NIST and ISO. Um, however, this does not significantly reduce the breaches. Organizations are using organizations that are using third-party auditors re, uh, report fewer incidents, and this highlights the value of external oversight and continuous improvement through regular assessment, policy updates, and training is crucial to strengthening the cybersecurity posture. So, all in all, we have found that um, in in order for public sector institutions to be ready or prepared to face cybersecurity um, attacks. There has to be training in place. Uh, the staff must be trained in terms of cybersecurity and awareness. And there has to be governance control in place to, for them to follow a specific standard or best practice in terms of responding to, to any cyber attacks and the larger organizations face uh, more data breaches. And yeah, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. And now I would like to call Sam to present his report. Thanks. Okay, uh, good morning, colleagues. My name is Samuel Lokupane. Um, I'll be taking you through the survey that we conducted around digital identity landscape. So the aim here, we were trying to uh, find out how organizations <coughs> that have or are using digital identity technologies or services view or are supported by the uh, government uh, regulations and uh, acts and standards. So <clears throat> the survey that we did, um, the respondents that we got, we got a couple of uh, response from government institutions to private as well as uh, other sectors in IT and uh, also higher education institutions. But mostly from the data that we gathered, uh, most of the respondents, especially these were in private sector, it was around Houting, followed by the Western Cape. Um, so before we ca I can even present on the uh, data that we got from the, uh, the survey, just to uh, discuss or take you through the overview of what digital identity entails. So uh, from the group with uh, our colleagues here, what we look at is we try to find out or uh, try to see how uh, digital identity as a service is being applied, but looking at the problem, the core problem of identity, because most of us are aware that identity of a person is something that changes with time. It's not something that becomes constant. So hence, digital identity technologies as they come, uh, hence there is a quite a lot of rise in terms of uh, attacks on this kind or stealing of uh, people's identity to be used somewhere. So if we look at the figure there, what we can then be able to, to see is that identity is built around two most, uh, or we can call them frameworks, or most pillars. It's security <coughs> and privacy. So with security, this is the core, because as colleagues have presented uh, around cybersecurity, we can see that security is the core element or the core 
pillar of every other uh, services that gets to be used on the network or on the internet. But privacy, when it comes to digital identity, this is more crucial because there's quite a lot of rise in terms of users out there to control how their information or their data is being used out there. So this survey, mostly as we're going to see, it, it will touch mostly on the privacy aspect because this was some of the, uh, the pain points that they've indicating, uh, touching on the standards, uh, the need of open standards to be widely used and also for the government regulations or acts to be improved so that privacy can, or users or the owners of this data can have more control of their identity. So on the other side, if we look at these tiers, uh, this is the kind of category that is out there because with tier one, we look at uh, traits. So these are the attributes that belongs to the person that cannot change things like your name, uh, the color of your eyes. So these are looked as uh, the bottom uh, fundamentals of uh, digital or your identity because those remains with you. But if we look at tier two, uh, these are kind of services that now if we go out there, you go to the bank, you open a credit card, uh, you start to introduce a relationship with the with the sec or with that bank, so they will give you uh, what we call a shared identity. So something that uh, they can use or, or to be able to identify you. And we see this if I go and open a uh, driver's license uh, card or I apply, the government will issue me that, but they will also include other traits that will change uh, over time. And of course, on the top one is uh, the abstracted identity. So this, it's commonly used nowadays uh, because we can even see uh, phishing emails or spam emails or even marketing uh, institutions that target us as a group. So what currently these uh, institutions out there and some of them where they, we got the response from them. So what they do is that they categorize or they group us based on our similarities. They will say Sam is a black man. Uh, in the age of 14, he's, uh, he belongs to this particular uh, organization. So they will group us according to that and try to target us. So we can see that if we talk about digital identity, this is a complex and a, a more uh, uh, topic that needs a lot of regulations or standards to be able to give the users the ability so that they can be able to control their data. Uh, if I go into the... Uh, the data or the response that we got from the participants. So we grouped these questions, there were quite a lot of, of them, but uh, on this slide, I'll just summarize uh, on the importance one. So if we look at the first one, so we asked them, why is digital identity important? And most of this response, of course, came from higher education institutions and other government. From the private sector, these people, they deal with this kind of uh, problems or because they are in that space to solve them. So, but one of the most critical one, even you can see from the graph, is that identification is the necessary element uh, uh, that one needs to be used so that you can be able to transact uh, with government services or any other services out there. The world is moving to digital uh, identifications of ourselves if we need to interact with other people. So this is the reason why now digital identity services or technologies are widely uh, being uh, used. So, but from this graph, what was most important was the, uh, the one with 28%, the threat management in high-risk environment. So you can see that most of these organizations, they start realizing that some of these, uh, especially in the banking sector, this is one of the sector that is leading in uh, implementation of digital identities because that is a high risk environment. So they need all kinds of protections or uh, securities around uh, how to protect the identity of their customers. Now, the second question was around digital identity types. So we wanted to see uh, across uh, South Africa, this uh, digital identity technologies or services that are being applied where or which sector is mostly are they applied for. So as you can see from the graph, what we obtain is that uh, these technologies are widely used to 
identify uh, natural or, uh, or people as. So, and it is true because every day when we go to, even in the bank, if you try to transact, the first thing they will want to is to identify you uh, if you go and visit someone. So these kind of technologies, we see them uh, out there, they're everywhere. But the other one that is uh, coming slowly is this uh, identification of uh, objects. So this plays a role in IoT, uh, in fourth industrial uh, instances or situations. So that is uh, slowly building up and it will uh, eventually um, uh, widely be uh, used in the country. So the second question is around the standards. So what kind of standards are widely used uh, to drive this technology so that it can be adopted? So from the graph, you can see that biometric standards are the ones that are leading. And, and of course, this is obvious because uh, biometrics are proven to be more useful in, in identifying people and uh, they are more secure. It's not easy to fake uh, someone else's identity through uh, biometric uh, means. But you can see that even other standards, uh, and this, of course, it's a combination that others gets used to on the people and others gets used on the object. Standards such as barcodes, this we can see, uh, IoT or most of these uh, objects out there, they've got their own identity in, in a form of a barcode. So these are typical. So we wanted to see uh, these uh, services that are out there, what or which standard or a combination of this standard are these services using. So as you can see, the cards, this is mostly used in the uh, financial uh, sector. And then tying to that, we try to identify or find out that uh, using this standard, because standards needs to be uh, supported by the regulations or the acts of the country. So is there any, or uh, these users of these digital identity services there, do they have uh, or do they understand what standard the government has already published to support these kind of uh, technologies as they apply it to them? So you can already see that the, uh, the introduction of POPIA, so most of the responses indicated that this uh, regulation uh, does or it has clauses that limits on what data can be uh, collected or processed from them. But of course, we, we, we know that there's quite a lot of uh, work that needs to be done around that because users uh, still feel that uh, their privacy at some instances get, uh, it's not protected or it's not addressed. The, the third one was uh, the draft, the policy draft that was published by the Department of Home Affairs. And of course, uh, uh, this draft, is, it builds uh, on top of the Identification Act so the idea here, because we know that the uh, home affairs is the is the uh, uh, the core within the country that or it's mandated to capture and record our identity, and of course, depending on they don't go to the relationship level because those are the sub uh, services that other organization can be able to build on, but they are trusted to ensure that our unique identity, they store them, and anyone who needs to verify can be able to, to then uh, query on their system. So they've introduced that standard, and we see that most of uh, the participants do have trust that this uh, draft uh, policy that the Home Affairs have published, it does somehow contain some clause that can limit what data may be collected from them and so forth. Um, so on the third question, we went in terms of the drivers to, to try to, to find out what uh, this uh, identity or digital identity drivers uh, in South Africa. And of course, as I indicated, the financial institutions or bank, they lead in, in terms of this. So most uh, users out there, they are aware that the bank uh, does offer these uh, types of digital identity and they feel safe interacting with the bank. And of course, what was interesting also is that the digital identity theft came up as one of the drivers uh, to, to sort of buy into this uh, uh, digital identity services or technology. So organizations are aware that there is a rise in identity theft within the country, so they try to uh, uh, purchase or build these digital identity technologies. 
colleagues have already indicated uh, through the cyber security survey that, um, I mean, security is the core or it is needed. So if someone tries to collect your identity, you, you will need to be uh, assured that your identity will not be uh, stolen or it, it will not be exposed to other kinds of threats out there. So this question uh, that we post out, we wanted to find the what kind of these threats are having the highest security risk on these digital identity technologies or services? So from the graph, you can see that data uh, breaches and phishing attacks, uh, most respondents indicated that this is of most uh, concern. And of course, uh, the question of centralized database came up as well. But we know this is a, a, a most sensitive uh, topic around because as we indicated, if we take an example of home affairs, they are uh, the mandated to be able to collect. So central, uh, centralized databases at some level of digital identities are crucial, especially for an entity that it's uh, to ensure that all our uh, identities are unique and there is no lot of duplicates. Um, another area of digital identity is trust. So if we speak about privacy, uh, trust is also uh, the cousin of that. So we also posed these kind of questions to say, uh, how do these uh, respondents feel in terms of these services that are out there that are managed by government versus uh, the, pr the private sector? So most of them indicated that uh, they will trust more on the private uh, for example, the data that we got, it was the banks, uh, because they feel that their uh, records or their digital identity uh, records are more safe than they are in the hands of the government. And of course, I know there's quite a lot of debate around those stats uh, as well. So the second one was around the cybersecurity legislation. So as a country, there are certain acts and uh, regulations that are published or around cybersecurity. And most respondents indicated that they do trust that uh, the, the introductions of these acts and regulations do indeed help in terms of uh, protecting their data. Um, yeah, privacy, we've already spoken about that. Then we did also ask a question around, uh, uh, do you foresee any privacy violation arising from the use of your digital identity data? And most of of course, this is a, it's not only common in South Africa, it's a global uh, challenge. So uh, it is indeed because there's quite a lot of, uh, as we indicated among the tiers, and most of these um, uh, violations of, or, or, or stealing of this digital identity data comes from the tiers as you move up into, in terms of uh, digital identity, how, you then get to build a relationship with other uh, institutions out there. So this does uh, bring uh, uh, these violations around your privacy. So most uh, respondents did indicate that, yes, they do uh, foresee um, these kind of violations around their data. Uh, as I indicated, this was just a summary. There's quite a lot of... Um, uh, questions that we did ask, but this is just on a snapshot uh, indication of what or the landscape, how South Africa is uh, gearing or is uh, they are tackling uh, problems around digital identity. So the key takeaways, there's quite a lot of them. I'll just focus on one. So as we can see, uh, around 74% uh, okay, third quarter felt that cybersecurity legislations. So there is a good uh, even though there are couples of bads or a lot of uh, negatives, but there's uh, good or two positives that we can take up because we can see that the, uh, the government does play a role in terms of ensuring that these regulations and acts are in place so that they can be able to assist uh, organizations that play in, in, in the space of creating this kind of technology that is going to acquire or store uh, the digital identities of respondents. And one of the other is that, um, the, yes, they believe that there, there are protections in place to limit access to, the, to their digital traits, but the question comes to say, how effective are those technologies uh, being used to ensure that if 
my digital identity or my record of digital identity gets stored, will I be able to trace and be able to tell who stole it and how to re reverse that process? So that, of course, it's something that um, uh, organizations and uh, government, they are working uh, to ensure that it is uh, taken care of. Um, so as I indicated, privacy violations came up and the greatest challenge uh, that, or in summary, when we summarized, we saw that most of responded indicated that one of the greatest challenge uh, to the adoption of this di digital identity, it's around uh, uh, cybersecurity, these threats coming uh, all over, and the lack of control on who is gathering information on us. Those were most of those concerns that they, they raised. Thank you very much. Uh, no. <clears throat> thank you, Samuel, for, for the presentation. And thank you for everyone who shared their presentations today. So we've come to, we've come to the end of our, okay, okay. We've come to the end of our presentations. So before we go to the Q&A, uh, I just wanted to mention that the full report will be published on the website, but the first one that we're going to publish today will be the preparedness and resilience report, and the other ones will follow uh, after, after, after a week. So we'll publish one report per week, but the resilience and preparedness one will be published today on the CSR website, and we'll also communicate that on our social media, social media pages. So yeah, colleagues and colleagues in the media, uh, now it's an opportunity to ask those questions. For those who have questions, we'll, we'll start with the online uh, people. If there's any questions on that side, Lindy. Okay, no, thank you. Uh, physical attendance. If the, okay, Zubeda, Dr. Zubeda. Okay, um, thanks for the opportunity. Um, it's great to be back. Um, everybody, I'm Zubeda Dawood from Splunk or Cisco, but formerly from the CSIR. So it's great to see the, the research come to light. Um, I just wanted to maybe weigh in on something on one of the surveys about the skills shortage. Um, I think it's really interesting, um, you know, some of the challenges faced in the public sector. But weighing in, um, bringing in some insights from the private sector, we find um, a lot that um, when public sector um, organizations employ managed service providers for cybersecurity, so when they have another company, you know, doing all of their incident response, their governance and all of that, um, it, it really does make a difference. So I believe at the CSR, you do um, offer managed service um, for cybersecurity. Um, and I think just that it's most welcomed. So yeah, keep up the good work, CSR. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the compliments, Doc. We we appreciate it. So I see there are three hands online. Um, so we'll start with uh, Dumiso, followed by Gosinachi, and then Simnikiwe. Thank you. chain attacks, you know, uh, which also become more prevalent. Um, what are the best practices um, that organizations like, you know, FSCA can implement to secure their third party vendors without compromising, you know, operation efficiency? Because um, I see that there's quite a gap, you know, um, um, you know, between IT operations and, and, and supply chain. So you find that, you know, most of the speakers they've mentioned, 
um, 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 human uh, human vulnerabilities, you know, within cybersecurity. So, but you know, there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a, there's a, there's a, a disconnection, you know, between uh, IT operations and 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 um, uh, supply chain uh, management. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks to Michelle. Can like, we miss the first part of the question? Uh, sorry, I want to ask you if you can repeat because we were not audible on Teams when you started the question. Thank you. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks. Um, am I audible? Yes. Now we can hear you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah. My question was more on 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 uh, artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. You know, um, seeing that there's a rise of uh, AI intelligence, um, you know, in both offensive and defensive strategies that uh, cyber criminals are using, you know, how do we foresee the balance shift in between AI being used for, I mean, being used for cyber attacks and also uh, using AI enhancing, in enhancing cyber security measures within, within organizations? Okay, no, thank you. We'll take the first four, four, first four questions and then we'll answer each of them. Uh, Gosnati, thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Gosnati Ndlohu. I am a journalist with Tech Central. My question is for Dr. Namosha Verasami, who mentioned in a presentation that remote work um, has an effect on cybersecurity. Could you please just give more detail on that and specifically say if remote work arrangements increase cybersecurity risks for organizations and if so, how? Thank you. Uh, okay. Hello. Good morning. Sinikiwe Nikiwa from ITOP here. Um, I hope I'm audible. Thank you for the presentation. I just want to get, <laughs> I just have a few things. Um, if I can just get some, uh, Dr. Jabu's last name, I didn't catch it at first. Um, but some of the questions uh, in regards to the presentation, one I have about, I think one of the presenters mentioned the financial loss in terms of you know the cybersecurity incidents uh, this would be awesome to find and service providers but i didn't get to the exact figure as to what that figure is for let's say the 2020 2023 financial year just some clarity on the financial loss and then um the uh, i think it was uh tuli who was speaking about tuli Mkwanazi about the public sector I just want to hear more about if she's able to, if they're able to uh, divulge um, the public sector institutions that were surveyed for for the public sector uh, awareness and um, preparedness uh, survey. Yeah, that's yes. And another one following on that one is just around if uh, based on the survey, if they've seen like an increase in terms of attacks against cyber not, um, against public sector institutions has there been an increase in the past year uh during which that the survey was uh conducted those are my questions thank you all right no thank you so we'll answer these first three questions before we can yeah so the first one about ai and cyber security doc would you like to take that one thanks uh, yes i think uh so my full name is uh, jabu j-a-b-u and then my surname is in 20 m t s w e n i uh, so yeah and then in in terms of um, the first question on ai uh, cyber security used for attacks as well as for protection i think yeah that's a very valid one and uh, it's a trend uh, that is, is 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 ongoing indeed so what we see particularly from um, the services point of view we see a lot of organizations uh um, including AI um, technologies with, within their stack in terms of how, for example, to pick up uh, or to detect attacks you know, quicker. Uh, so that's what we see. Uh, and, and I think generally uh, mostly of, uh, overseas companies will be ahead in, in, in that regard uh, in terms of incorporating AI into some of their solutions, whether it's about uh, picking up you know, phishing scams, detecting malicious activities, whether it's on ransomware or other new attacks that uh, the criminals may be coming up with. But of course, the opposite is also true uh, in terms of the what we see, the the criminals as well using you know AI uh, to also advance their 
uh, techniques in terms of committing cyber crime. And we have seen that uh, as well when the generative AI you know, came in, into, into, into the storm, if I can call it that, where we see a lot of phishing emails nowadays they are generated, for example, using uh, generative AI. And, and we see a lot of uh, phishing websites being spawned out quicker uh, than maybe what would happen before. So uh, in as much as AI is for good, but it can also be used uh, uh, for bad. And within the CSR, we also have a, a, a cluster or a center rather that also deals with, with trying to come up with new ways in terms of how can we use AI to protect you know, ourselves online as well as uh, deal with some of the challenges that are there. But, but I think we are still at the uh, very early stages as a country in, in this regard, but I think there's, there's a lot of work you know, that we are doing in terms of ensuring uh, that we also, we also catch up. And then the second question of the first question, I think it was more the gap between the IT operations versus the, the supply chain, if I, if I can call it that. And I think it's also a very valid point, which you know, when we speak about supply chain security, we, we see that a lot because this is not only a technical issue, but it's also you know, a legal or a governance issue where, for example, many organizations, when um, they are getting service providers, the issues of vetting is still very, very limited. And I, I want to just give an example with, with some things that we see, for example, in the world, you know, where uh, companies nowadays can be set up, you know, to sell you security solutions that in the end can come and attack you. We have seen it, uh, for example, between, you know, some of the wars that are taking place uh, uh, in the East. So those are just some of the things uh, when it comes to supply chain and IT operations or IT services being aligned. Very, very important, even from the selection, from the security point of view. I think uh, uh, I've addressed that. Maybe let me allow my colleagues to address the others. I can come back and address the issue of the financial losses, um, maybe just to, to emphasize on it. But Dr. Namusha, you can uh, you can uh, take off. Yes, so the question posed was related to uh, remote work and its effect on cybersecurity and whether it creates an increase um, with regards to cybersecurity risk. So what we found in the survey is that 63% of the respondents did say they were working hybrid. So this indicates they are using a combination of working from the office and at home. So why does work from home create greater risks? Um, often what you would find is that sometimes at home, members do not have the same controls as they would have in, in the workplace. Also, sometimes members um, at home would, uh, would relax some of the security controls or security practices. So what you would find is they would might download some files offline, save it not onto the secure cloud infrastructure or the, the, the secure folders or platforms. So you find that members tend to sort of uh, have oversight over sometimes good security practices and may make inadvertent mistakes that might compromise the data in, in some cases. Um, often also, um, with, with security practices, what you need to require is multi-factor authentication to ensure that the users actually logging on from home or wherever are actually the users themselves. So often one of the more con the, the stronger controls that are being perpetuated and being pro um, promoted is the use of multi-factor authentication to ensure that it's actually the user that is accessing the work systems, the work um, processes, and the data. I think also at home, sometimes members would try to look for ways to bypass certain controls and not adhere to some of these practices. So what you find is they might um, might open up some backdoors to sensitive data. So overall, what you may find is that um, you do need some stronger controls, just measures in place to check and ensure that users are adhering and following um, the, the policies of the organization and not inadvertently exposing some of the data um, or, or, or systems to exposure. Okay, no. Thank you. Uh, we'll come back to you, Hans. Just want to take the last question, the, the last question directed to Tuli before Dr. Chabuton can talk about the financial losses. Okay, thank you. So the question was, can I divulge which of these public sector entities did we interview? I cannot divulge this. It would be against our ethics policy, but I can mention that uh, we covered a diverse range of South African public sector institutions, and this include government departments, municipalities, and other public entities. 
Thank you. Okay, so so Simnigu, I think I want to just deal with the issue of the financial loss because yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, numbers and and uh, that that we find and obviously from different studies, but uh, and I know sometimes there's a number that is uh, has been used quite often, which is two point two billion losses with regards to uh, cyber crimes. But I think that number is outdated now because uh, it was done in 2013, and I think Sabrik um, were the, in the, the, the sources of that number. If we look currently, of course, it's always very difficult to measure the exact financial loss. Most of the numbers that we are talking about here are just estimates, right? Um, looking just at the uh, what Homba presented, where organizations, for example, can suffer in, in a range of f uh, 40 to 50 million. Uh, obviously, it depends on the scale of that, but 40 to 50 million per data breach, for example. And, and that can happen because of various other things. You know, you need to get service providers. You might have downtime. There might be losses in terms of services and the likes. So, but if you use those estimates, which other organizations such as IBM have confirmed, that a breach on an average it would cost about 50 million. Now take that and uh, look at how many companies in South Africa br uh, report bridges on a monthly basis. And considering that not everybody uh, generally reports, so we've got about 450 companies a month in South Africa that report some of these bridges. So if you add the two, you can closely easily get to 500 million uh, financial losses just per month. If you multiply that by 12, it can go to, 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 to a lot of billions. I think it's about 90. But of course, all of this needs to be taken into context um, because within the cybersecurity instance, the financial loss can be um, uh, can be suffered in various layers. For example, some of the data, you know, in terms of the banking, digital banking fraud, which I think many people would experience, um, they, they are looking at about one billion. So this is a figure that is in the public domain. So it's about one billion per year in South Africa only, just on digital fraud. So that's just the impact that we have. If we just look at cyber crime, which uh, some other organizations have conducted, such as the Interpol in the whole of Africa, uh, we are looking at almost something like 72 billion, which almost uh, 80 or maybe let's say 60% of that is, 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 is within the South African economy, which is obviously one of the biggest in, in, in Africa. So, and, and there's other data points we can look at. You know, we were looking at what does it cost to lose one the digital identity of a person? And the estimates tell us that one data point, in other words, my identity can cost something like 3,000 rand, just my identity. So if you look in South Africa where you have a data breach of about 40 million people at one go, that can go even over 100 billion. So that is what I'm saying. There's not just one figure that can assess the impact, but some of these figures, they are giving us an indication in terms of where the, 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 the financial impact might be at. And I hope uh, Simniki, I answered your question. Thank you very much. Okay, no, thank you, Doc. Uh, so we'll take the next round of questions. Uh, we'll take one in person from Hans, and then I see online there's a hand from Sibonello and also from Michelle. Uh, Hans, you can go. Thank you very much. I'm from Engineer IT. My name is Hans von der Grunendal. Um, it just would be interesting to see that first slide that was on the screen uh, showed a number of blips, and particularly one very not so long ago. And I'd be interesting to know what, if we know why those blips, why, why we had this tremendous upsurge, and then all of a sudden it came down, and then it slowly sort of increases again. And my other question is, is the problem that uh, people are always accused of not patching the security updates. Uh, in your research, did you find any correlation between the lack of patching and the incidence of, of, of um, either uh, phishing or, or any of the, uh, the other possible uh, cyber crimes? Uh, is there a, a relationship between that? It would be interesting to see. Because I, I so often hear people saying, well, I only uh, take my Microsoft patch once a month because it takes too much data. Um, so I think that's perhaps interesting if one could see the, the, the lack between patching 
and and the increase in in, in the tax for people that hadn't fetched. Thank you. Okay, no, thank you, Hans. Uh, Sponelo, online, just go ahead. All right, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, um, the CSIR, for this uh, session. Um, it's very like informative and it gives us a little bit of hope when it comes to issues of cybersecurity around the country or in Africa in general. So my concern is particularly um, when it relates to the things that you've mentioned with our service providers. I can see, oh, Chair, there uh, by yourself, you have a Dell product. And I would like to also just to ask, um, with what comes to this, um, since you have mentioned on the presentation there as well, that um, some of the cyber uh, uh, related issues are coming from hardware related incidents. So my question is particularly to say, ask that, um, how confident are we with our service providers as a nation or uh, in, instead as an African continent to say that, um, can we really dwell on the um, um, the European um, or maybe rather outside um, countries to supply us with these gadgets? And what are the impacts as we are seeing on the war in the Middle East? The, the, the speaker there also mentioned that there was an incident of pages that happened in the Middle East. So it is an, something that is um, of alarming to us as a, as a nation to say, are we really like um, trusting these people? in terms of them providing us with these uh, gadgets. Yes, it, it, it eases our works and everything, but it, does it really pose a threat to us in cyber-related incidents, like cyber war crimes as well? So that's my particular concern. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Sponele. Uh, Michelle, let's go ahead. Thanks so much, Chair, and uh, what a wonderful presentation and media briefing. Thank you so much for arranging. Uh, I'm Michelle Govender, and I look at industrial cybersecurity. Um, so this, this has been quite an insightful discussion for me to pay attention to. Uh, my question is around the cybersecurity frameworks and um, the policies and practices part of the presentation there. Um, you know, I have a question around the the finding that says that adopting, uh, following these specific frameworks does not significantly reduce breaches. Um, and I'm just wanting to know uh, why does the research team who came up with that conclusion feel this way? Uh, what have they seen in these state-owned organizations um, that lead us to, to, to this conclusion? Particularly around, um, you know, if if global organizations and sort of leading cybersecurity organizations globally are saying that we should adopt a framework and thereafter implement it, uh, why then? I'm curious to know why then is the research team saying that following these frameworks does not significantly reduce breaches? Where is the gap? And uh, thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, let's over to Dr. Jabunzwe. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Michelle, as well, um, and Sponello and Hans. So I think, Hans, in terms of the, the, that spike that you saw uh, in, in that graph, generally in the digital phase, uh, and I think in, in that, I just don't remember the year exactly, but I think it must be between 2019 and 2020. I, I will just check. But that's when the log4j uh, vulnerability was discovered, uh, which impacted a lot of uh, uh, companies, you know, because, and that was in a short space of time. So, and the criminals were also taking advantage. And then the other part was more uh, the ransomware. There was a time when we had um, a ransomware uh, vulnerability, uh, and, and there was a new uh, ransomware that sort of uh, uh, spread across the world at a very quick pace. Uh, so those are, are the two. So it's almost similar. Ob obviously, this one was not necessarily a cyber attack, but we can say it was just a cyber incident. The um, uh, CrowdStrike and Microsoft glitch, you know, so generally those kind of incidences, they are the ones that cause the spike because their impact is across the world. So generally, that's, that, that's what you see there. Uh, I think the issue of lack of patching versus incidences that would lead to the team, maybe Tuli and Namosha can answer. Uh, in, in that regard. And then, uh, yeah, the issue of service providers, I will ask Billy to, to touch on it. But I just wanted to, to also say, yeah, this is, is always very tricky. And I think 
all nations, they face the same problem. Uh, and because we are a global world, we collaborate, you know, so th there's always a question of saying, how do we ensure that we are not paranoid, but also uh, we, we check our securities when we work with others. And I know the example you've given of Israel and, um, uh, and Lebanon is a typical example within the cyber space. But unfortunately, I cannot really comment much on it, but we have, we have, we have, we have studied a, a lot on that. So maybe it deserve another another discussion. I will give Billy to that, and then I think the issue of cyber security framework, uh, Tuli and the colleagues will answer that. Uh, thank you. Billy, you want to add on some service providers, and uh, how confident are we in terms of them when they are servicing us? Uh, thank you, Doc. Um, I think we're in a weird space where we have to both trust and distrust the entities that we use for security and manage security services. So, sorry, Billy, um, just introduce yourself, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Billy Petzer. I am Research Group Leader for Cybersecurity Systems in the Information Cybersecurity Center. Um, so as I was saying, we kind of have to trust and distrust these entities. Um, there's no way we can work without them. And of course, it's a net positive what they're doing you know, for us. Um, but what we've seen that we kind of have to give them unmitigated access to our networks, to our systems, in order to get the security services that they do provide. And again, in the case of CrowdStrike, um, you know, we've seen that, in, in, in a sense, they can actually be the problem at the end of the day. Um, they can be the cyber incident and not the, the solution. Um, so what do we do? Do we not use any of these organizations? Do we not trust them? Of course not. Uh, we're still in a space where we need to rely on each other and still have um, you know, a measure of uh, trust, but as I say, trust, but verify. So let's do our due diligence with organizations that we do use. Let's check what controls they have in place. Um, you know, let's not just uh, use the most common organizations or the big names to secure us. Uh, let's find out about them and their practices and what security controls they have in place per, um, internally, what policies they use, and then try and make an informed decision. Um, but, you know, risk will always be present. We can never reduce it to 0%. There will always be a measure of risk. It's just how do we manage it at the end of the day. No, thank you. Uh, Tuli? Thank you. So I'd like to answer the question on um, why does following these global cybersecurity frameworks does not significantly decrease breaches. And um, this is because Firstly, they are not enforceable, so it's, it's optional for any organization to implement these uh, frameworks. And also, should they be implemented, we don't know as to the depth of uh, to which these frameworks are implemented. Also, there's the, the issue with um, the human factor or human errors being the number one contributor in, in data breaches. So even if there are uh, frameworks and standards that are being um, implemented within an organization, the lack of cybersecurity awareness from the employees may still increase the um, chances of data breaches. Uh, this also correlates to uh, insider threats as well, which uh, it's also employees that can have access to sensitive data. Another issue could be third-party vulnerabilities, which also ties to what Billy was alluding to. There may be organizations uh, that do not um, implement any frameworks and are in a relationship with an organization, and these third parties may then introduce um, chances of the data being breached. And yeah, there are many specific reasons that I can think of, but I, I believe that the three would answer the question. Thank you. So, so maybe there was just one question that Hans asked in terms of uh, did we see any correlation between lack of patching and incidences? Do you want to comment on that? If we didn't, we can say. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't analyze the correlation between patching and, yeah. But I think what was interesting, what the results were saying based on what you showed was some organizations only, I think, but it was a small percentage, if I remember, they only patched after the incident. But I think one of the other thing which may not have been part of the results, Hans, that we tend to see as well, 
is that in, in, in many other cases, as some of the bridges come through legacy systems, in other words, systems that are, you know, cannot be patched anymore, uh, and, um, and maybe organizations or maybe the, the service providers no longer support, but organizations are keeping them because, you know, in terms of transition and stuff like that, there are a lot of other complications such as finances. Yeah, but I'm sure the team can, can, can start to look uh, for, the, for future work in terms of how do we correlate in terms of lack of patching and incidents as well as uh, some of these other items you've raised. Thank you very much. And thank you colleagues for answering those questions. So we'll take the next round of questions. Uh, I see the hand there. Okay, you can go ahead, my sister. Thank you. My name is Tsakani Makaia from I'm a director of Center of Innovation in EGAV. My interest is in cyber training and awareness program to government employees. I just want to find out what security training program that CSIR offer to government employees. How does CSIR ensure its training programs stay up to date with emerging cyber threats? What is the scope of CSIR cybersecurity awareness initiative for government institutions? What types of cybersecurity training are provided? For example, phishing, incident response. Are training programs tailored to specific government department roles, for example, leadership or operational teams? I uh, also want to know how does CSIR CSA, <laughs> Since I are measure the effectiveness of train of its training programs, and um, for partnership and collaboration, I just want to find out: Does CSIR collaborate with other organizations to provide cybersecurity training? Are there any international partnership to leverage best practices? How does CSIR engage with government agencies to understand their training needs? Thank you. I can respond to that one. Uh, so there's quite a few questions you posed there, so I'll just try to, to touch on them. So yes, we do uh, provide cybersecurity training and awareness training and do work with um, government entities. So the way that we typically would approach it is, it's not just in isolation that we would do cybersecurity awareness training or um, skills development. We often are consulted on an overall approach to look at uh, the strategy, the governance, the policy, the various aspects. So we touch on the various components of, of awareness and technical skills as well. So regarding your question about how do we differentiate and um, offer training for different specialized roles, um, with the awareness training, we start off with basic awareness training. This is um, targeted at members that have no cybersecurity um, principles or understanding of cybersecurity. And then we also have management training as well to, to um, um, provide a background on why cybersecurity is important for the organization as well. Um, as we work with different um, entities, we also look at the needs. Um, if there's a need for, for example, if they say to us they're also interested in doing penetration testing or vulnerability scanning, we also develop uh, specific targeted modules for those requirements. So we, we look at it from a holistic point of view. We look at all the aspects from the governance to the identification to protection response. We're not just focusing, for example, on the human element but we're also looking at um, the technical skills as well that are required. So as requests come in, we would develop that material in relation um, to the request. In terms of partnerships and collaborations with, with other trainers, I think many of us work with universities in that. Um, we're not an accredited training institution, but we do offer this training. We are working in the sectors and the industry, so we are aware of the necessary skills that are needed. Um, our members also do certifications and training. Um, we have a lot of training platform subscriptions as well, so we offer these services. So we work together with all the different organizations that are interested to look at holistic services. Where, where are you, what do you need? Um, what, what are your training needs? So we do offer a variety of, of services and practices and try to assist organizations from an uh, overall point of view, how to start off with their cybersecurity practices, build up, emp empower the employees, and then on their own, be able to, to tackle and, and deal with cybersecurity within the organization as well. 
Thank you so much. Just a uh, follow up question quickly. I just want to make an example, like for Department of uh, Home Affairs. Um, do you do your research and do you tailor, as you said, you tailor your training according to the, the need of uh, an organization? So, in case of Home Affairs, as we know, there's a lot of um, um, identity theft there. How do you assist them? How do you resolve practical uh, challenges that we face as government in terms of making sure that those threats are mitigated? Thank you. So as you've, if you've noted, um, you've indicated an area that they would require assistance with. So we would then do our research and develop a module related to that. Um, we, are you, uh, sorry, I remember one of your other questions. You also mentioned how do we assess um, and, uh, and assess whether it's been effective. So typically what we do is we start off with the training. We do a pre-assessment to look at the current knowledge levels. Um, we then deliver the training. So we could do a wide, different variety of forms of training. We could do videos. We could do in-person presentations virtual training so it just depends on the need of the organization we can train smaller groups larger groups it, it depends on on the requirements um, like you mentioned we would do research on the ways that the, that the threats is carried out so we, again we would, could do investigations to determine how are members disclosing this information how are they falling victim to these phishing attacks malware what are they their surfing practices how are they falling victim to this um, and then again increasing the awareness creating knowledge and teaching about to the dangers of, of insecure um, usage of ICT infrastructure. And so again, like you mentioned, we would do research, build up the module, then deliver the training, and then we also do post assessment again to determine whether the members had actually, if there's been an increase in knowledge. I just want to maybe just add, uh, obviously CSR is a state entity, um, and our role in terms of scientific and industrial research is, is, is about how do we improve the quality of life of our people and that includes working and ensuring that the work that we do has impact you know in government and 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 key to some of the questions that we have asked is that the work that we do we don't just do it on our own because we don't believe that we can solve all the problems that are there we partner a lot with local entities we are very strong on working with uh, smes that's number one but we also, and I think you asked one of the questions in terms of how uh, we, we draw from international best practices. So we work as well with, with international companies, obviously in line with our objectives and ensuring that whatever um, we work with them with, it can support you know, enabling our, our, our state. Obviously, it's always very difficult to speak about others, you know, specific departments. But just like Sam was, was talking, some of, some of the work that we do, uh, it always has to find relevance in departments. Let's talk about EGAV since you are here. EGAV, if EGAV has specific needs, the, the CSR working with its partners in this domain, and, and by the way, not even in cyber only, across all our various domains, the, the CSR is able to then you know, pull those resources to address a specific need, because I think that's very critical you know, for us, not just to answer problems generally, but to answer them specific to your needs. Because you know, one organization, even if it's two government departments, they are always different because culture and all those sort of things are there. So, so we are indeed a, a, you know, and we call ourselves an epic organization and collaboration is one of our core things. So we collaborate and that is why even today, you know, we bring different partners together because we believe that our work is not just for us, but it's for, for the country. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you, Doc, for that uh, response, and thank you, Namusha. And just to add on that, uh, based on the conversation that you've been having now, um, like Doc, Doc said, we're open for collaboration, and I think this conversation, if like you can take it further with the team after the meeting to see how the CSR can work with with your with the organization and see how we can, you know, better come up with solutions that touch lives through the work that we do. Uh, no, thank you, colleagues. I don't see any hands online. Uh, are there further questions to the colleagues attending in person? All right, no. Uh, thank you. I think we have come to the end of the session. I'll just ask Dr. Jabu just to give us a few closing remarks, and then we we call it a, a day for the session. Thank you. Uh, no, th uh, thank you very much, and uh, uh, Kulani, for, for, for ending the session. And thank you to, to everyone who has made time 
to at least join us and for us to share some of our work and for listening to some of our uh, young researchers. I'm sure people can also see uh, we've got young researchers, women, uh, because in this field, one of the other issues is uh, uh, it's still a male-dominated field. So we also do uh, our part in actually ensuring that we diversify this field. I think it's very, very important for, for, for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thank the media for supporting us from your different organizations uh, in terms of ensuring that you, 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 you cover uh, the work that we do because ours is not just um, uh, for profit, but it's to ensure that we improve the country. And we also want to thank some of our board members. And I know Michelle is one of our board members who joined us online. So we want to thank them. Uh, and then also uh, the CSR colleagues. And then, uh, as, as, as it was said, the reports, full reports will be available online. Um, I think we'll start with one. But as the teams finalize just the presentations of those, they'll be available on, online. But should you have any other information, maybe Kulani, we can give the contacts. I don't know who they must contact between yourself and Petulo, and then we will take it from there. But thank you very much, uh, colleagues. It is really appreciated. All right. No, thank you, Doc. So for those who need like us for media interviews, can contact Petulo or myself, and we'll facilitate those interviews. And those of us who are attending in person, yeah, we'll have something just to, yeah. Unfor <laughs> unfortunately, we couldn't organize a virtual lunch, so, but we have a physical one, yeah. Thank you, Felix. Thank you. Bye-bye.